Welcome back to another Keen Medic video, guys. So, in this video, we are going to be talking about Albert's abdominal pain. Okay, so this is obviously an MRCP paces video, so it's not a surgical problem. Okay, but stay with me, let's get through this. In this video, we're going to be talking about the scenario first. We'll then talk about your plan and your differential diagnosis after a quick uh, overview of the scenario. We'll look at the scenario a bit closer in terms of examination, differentials, all of that stuff. And then we'll do a review of it. And finally, I'll give you the bite-sized bundle for paces that I'll have brought together based on the scenario. So make sure you stay right until the end, guys, okay, to get the most out of this. Speaking of that, when you see this bell icon, pause the video and have a think, okay, and just follow the instructions to get the most out of it. For those of you who are really motivated, want to progress your careers and pass paces, this course is for you guys, okay? So paces course online, I've brought together my years of um, experience in teaching doctors and also students to bring together lots of different frameworks and useful material, including top presentations that come up in paces that I have written myself self lots of frameworks that you can use from day one all the way up to paces as well as plenty of downloadable material that i have put together just for you okay this is exclusive to the course lots of people are finding value make sure you go check it out the description is down below and because you have subscribed to my youtube you're watching my uh, videos on youtube i've also created a code just for you guys so you make sure you use the code when you are getting the course for yourself okay go check it out let's carry on here's a scenario Albert is a 49-year-old man who has been ab admitted due to worsening abdominal pain. Okay, so young man, abdominal pain. Uh, past medical history is he has type 2 diabetes, cirrhosis, and he's had his appendix, appendix out. So it's not appendicitis, okay? With the ambulance crew, uh, he is alert. His heart rate is increased. It's 124. Uh, blood pressure is low, okay? So heart rate is increased and blood pressure is low. So concerning. His respirator is 24 and saturations are 98% on air and temperature is 37.1 degrees Celsius. So he is um, basically tachycardic, hypotensive to some extent, and tachypneic. Uh, so something worrying is going on here. So, guys, what are your differentials and further management at this point in time? What would you like to do as the medical registrar on call? as the as someone who's done mrcp paces okay whilst you're having a think like the video so that it is recognized by the youtube algorithm and it is pushed forward to your friends and colleagues and everyone gets educated uh, and there is value spread all around and the channel grows as well support the channel so that i can continue making videos like this for you guys okay so after you've had a think, let's get back to the video. So the differentials at this point, perhaps this is this kind of thing I would be thinking about. Has this man got an acute abdomen? Okay, young man, he's had appendicitis before. Has this, has he got something similar? Is this bowel obstruction, diverticulitis, perforation? We don't know, okay? Pancreatitis is another one because he's got cirrhosis, doesn't he? So maybe he is drinking. Uh, maybe he's got pancreatitis, okay? Cholecystitis, cholangitis, so he is a middle-aged person, so, you know, that's possible as well. Eurosepsis, of course, can happen in literally uh, any person, right? So that's another thing to think, think about. Constipation, similarly, can happen when any, in any person. Less likely because he um, is tachycardic and a bit hypertensive, so you wouldn't get that with constipation. So here's the story. Let's have a closer look then. Abdominal pain has been go getting worse over the last seven days, generalized as well. And he has actually been opening his bowels fairly normally, he says. He goes about one to two times uh, per day, and that, that hasn't really changed. He's also passing urine, okay? That's a lower urinary tract symptoms. He doesn't have any of that. No fevers or any other infective symptoms. So that pretty much rules out infective causes. Okay, so what could be going on? Let's look at this. So he has been drinking six cans of cider a day, okay, and he continues to do that. So he's clearly drinking very heavily, so that should guide you towards the diagnosis now. 
He also smokes heavily and uses cocaine. He's not an intravenous drug user of note. All right, so basically, he has got generalized abdominal pain worsening over the last week, and he is drinking very heavily, okay? Let's have a closer look then. Now you're going to examine the patient. So as the medical registrar, you see him, and you find that he is grossly jaundiced. Respiratory rate is increased, and he has got small amounts of dried blood on his lips, okay? There's nothing fresh, that, there is nothing actively there, but there is clearly he has had some bleeding, and there is a tiny bit of blood around the lips that has that has clotted, old, old stuff, okay? His abdomen is distended, and he has got generalized discomfort all around the abdomen. There is no obvious peritonism. He also has palmar erythema on his palms, okay? So you know where we're going with this. He has got spider nevi. He has got eight of them that you can identify on the chest, on the front, okay? So above five is significant. He also has gynecomastia of note. As the medical registrar, however, you want to make sure before you accept the patient, uh, because once they come to you, it's always very difficult to uh, get them to other specialties, as you well know. You ask the A&E team to get a CT abdomen first to rule out any surgical causes, okay? So you get that done. So the a &E team kindly do that, and uh, the CT abdomen comes back with this report. There is no perforation, no other surgical causes found. The pancreas is fine as well, and there is large volume ascites of note. There is, of course, established cirrhosis, and on top of that, there is splenomegaly present as well. Okay, so we'll come to a few of these th things down the line. Blood tests show that his sodium is 129, his potassium is 4.5, all his uh, liver functions are basically deranged, okay, bilirubin, ALT and ALP are all raised. Albumin is 22, that's low. INI is 2.1, uh, rather, and that is high, okay, INI is deranged, he's not on any blood thinners, no anticoagulants, but his INI is raised. His hemoglobin is 108, so he's anemic, and his MCV is 110, that's raised. Platelet count is reduced, that is low at 79, and his amylase is normal. Okay, so let's run through the blood test quickly. His bilirubin, the fact that his sodium is low, is in keeping with his liver condition. Bilirubin, uh, ALT and ALP are uh, deranged. That is that is basically telling you that his liver function is off overall, okay? Albumin is low and his INI is raised. That tells you that his synthetic function of the liver is compromised, that is reduced as well, that is impaired, okay? That is why his uh, protein synthesis is reduced, therefore his albumin is low and similarly his INI is raised. His hemoglobin is low, he's anemic, and his MCV is high, that is macrocytic anemia, keeping in keeping with the alcohol component, okay? And his platelets are also reduced. So this is in keeping with chronic liver disease. And that also explains why he has got dried blood, because he's clearly had some bleeding and there is um, clotted blood, okay? So he, he is coagulopathic. So his ionized rays and his platelet count is reduced. This is all due to chronic liver disease. His CRP is 9, so there's nothing infective going on. So what is your diagnosis now, guys? So we have had a lot of clues so far. So that diagnosis really is ascites secondary to decompensated alcoholic liver disease. So this is why he's coming. So his abdominal pain is due to the ascites because of the decompensation of his chronic alcoholic liver disease. Okay, I hope that makes sense. A lot of words there, but this is basically what's going on. Okay, so let's go back to Albert and try and put everything together. He obviously has got a background of uh, heavy alcohol use. He has come in with a week's history of abdominal pain, which is generalized, and he's known to have uh, liver cirrhosis. He has now got uh, jaundice and ascites on top of his cirrhosis and um, chronic alcohol use. He now has got blood, uh, blood on his lips, which is uh, old and clotted, so he's got uh, coagulopathy. 
and he's got splenomegaly on his CT abdomen. You wouldn't really be able to feel it if you uh, examined him because he's got large volume ascites, so it's confirmed on the CT. This tells you that he's got portal hypertension as well, secondary to his cirrhosis. If he didn't have portal hypertension, you wouldn't really get splenomegaly, okay? So he's coagulopathic and he's got splenomegaly. So this is everything, all the parts of the jigsaws coming together. Here's a bite-sized bundle for basis. So this is the scenario, okay? So he has got decompensated liver disease, and that's what he has come in with. There are the four cardinal features that you have to be thinking about when it comes to decompensation. There are four kind of pillars of decompensation that you should look out for. This is jaundice, ascites, encephalopathy, and coagulopathy, okay? So jaundice, ascites, encephalopathy, and coagulopathy. You, you, you're welcome to come up with a mnemonic of your own if you want, uh, but there are only four components, so it's fairly easy to remember. In terms of the causes of chronic liver disease, okay, not decompensation, this is chronic liver disease we're talking about, okay, so alcohol is the top cause by far, okay, and that's the thing that you always have to remember and that's the thing you always have to talk about first in your exam as well. So alcohol is always the top cause, followed by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, okay, or NASH cirrhosis, which, whichever you want to say. Hepatitis uh, can be caused by viral most commonly, so that's what you would also be thinking about. So these are the top three causes, okay? So alcohol, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and hepatitis. Followed by other things like autoimmune causes such as uh, primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis, and also hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease. So the, to the bottom three are never the things you should be saying out loud first when you're discussing with your examiners, okay? You should, this is kind of the order that you should go through with your examiners when you're discussing them. When you're investigating the diagnostic things that will give you as to you know uh, the uh, diagnosis would be stuff like the blood test first of all so you would do all the basic stuff as well as the liver function bone profile and the INR INR of course will tell you what the synthetic function is like acidic tab will tell you whether or not they have got spontaneous bacterial peritonitis Ammonia levels really are for encephalopathy. If you think a patient is um, encephalopathic due to their chronic liver disease, then you would consider sending ammonia levels, okay? You should always check with your lab how to send it first because there can be issues sending it. Sometimes you need to send it with ice. It, you know, uh, you need to collect the sample and put it in ice and send it uh, across to the lab, for instance. So check with your lab first, ammonia level if the patient is confused, okay? Ultrasound and CT abdomen for imaging purposes to see whether there is anything else going on. In terms of the underlying cause, you could think about alcohol level if it is an acute presentation, lipid profile obviously if they have got evidence of NASH cirrhosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, viral screen if you're suspecting uh, viral hepatitis, you would still do it you would still do it anyway if you've got a patient with cirrhosis to make sure that it's not a viral uh, viral cause, okay? And similarly, you would think about autoimmune screen as well. When you're managing them, there are, uh, well, three main components. Uh, the first one is always alcohol abstinence. So that is the one most important thing, okay? You have to always cover that with the patient. You have to get the, get the alcohol liaison team involved, especially if the patient is uh, happy or keen to uh, give up or cut down on alcohol, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is the acute side, and the third thing is the uh, longer term side, okay? So the, on the acute side, you would always think about IV Pabrinex in the first, um, as the first thing that you would do. You would, you, you would need to give uh, vitamin supplementation and replacement. So IV Pabrinex in the acute hospital setting, followed by chlordiazepoxide or diazepam, whatever is used in your hospital uh, for... Um, alcohol withdrawal purposes, okay, and CO scoring, which is done by the nurses, okay, to grade the patient on uh, their alcohol withdrawal. Followed by laxatives, because you need to make sure that they're opening their bowels regularly. If they are not, then they are essentially at risk of having hepatic encephalopathy in these patients, liver patients. You always need to make sure they're opening their bowels regularly. Nutrition is absolutely key, so dietitians need to be involved uh, and they need to be on a low-salt diet as well. 
diuretics is something that you should be considering if they have if they are overloaded if you've got ascites these would be mainly spironolactone and furosemide spironolactone is usually the first one that you would consider you would also be, you would also be thinking about things like human albumin solution because they would be hypoalbuminemic so that's essentially a way of giving them fluid and giving them albumin um, of of course because these patients uh, have got edema and ascites you can't really give them other kinds of fluids other than albumin okay if they have got evidence of kind of renal failure on top then you would also think about things like terlipressin okay these are things that you should always be running past the gastroenterology th team uh, anyway. They should always be involved in decompensated liver patients. Okay, um, So you shouldn't be managing them on your own. Acidic drain for symptom relief uh, and also to help with their breathing uh, is important. Uh, and the thing is that you should always uh, practice caution because if they've got renal failure or hepatic encephalopathy, then acidic drains can exacerbate this. So you should never do that if they've got these sort of issues uh, as well as ascites. So renal failure and encephalopathy on top of ascites, you shouldn't be draining these patients, which is why it's always important to involve the uh, gastroenterology team and as well as ITU if need be. And in the longer term, you should be replacing them, uh, replacing their vitamins. So you should be putting these patients on thiamine and vitamin uh, B cold strong tablets, okay, uh, in the longer term when they are going home. Finally, you should be thinking about transplant. I say you, but this is really under the realm of the gastroenterology team, okay. Transplant is something that would only be considered if the patient is abstinent from alcohol, if they are, um, you know, abusing alcohol and they are dependent on alcohol. So at least six months or more is currently what we would want. Uh, otherwise, they would not be a candidate for transplant, okay? If, of course, the underlying cause is something else, like, say, an autoimmune cause, such as primary biliary cirrhosis, and they don't consume alcohol at all, then, of course, they would be a candidate for transplant, and they can be put on the transplant list, okay? So I hope this is useful, guys. Take a screenshot, make notes, uh, come back, okay, uh, to this video and share it wide. Uh, put a th thumbs up as well, click on it, and stay subscribed, guys, okay? I will see you in the next video. In the meantime, go check out my book and also Pace's course online. Use the code when you are getting the course, okay? Take care. I'll see you in the next video.